Hi everyone, we are starting a new topic today, which is topic five, and it's all on gases. Gases deserve its own chapter because they are everywhere, just like in the previous chapter we talked about aqueous solution. In fact, our atmosphere, as you might know, is surrounded by gases that we call air, and there is actually a collection of gases that make up air, with the majority components being oxygen and nitrogen. Gases are also important in industrial production of different chemicals and there's other applications that require the substances to exist in the gas form before they can be used. I want to get started by talking about some easily observable or microscopic properties of gases. The first one being that when a substance is in a gas phase, its volume changes significantly with pressures. You can see it very clearly by pressing down on a syringe that's filled with air and see how easy it is to press that air even though it's being blocked by a finger on the other end. So there's a lot of empty space in there so it's very easy for you to push things around and push down on those empty spaces. If you remove the pressure and the gases immediately push out, very quickly it equilibrates itself with the outside pressure. Gas volume changes also significantly with temperature in addition to pressure. Here's an example of a balloon that we pour a liquid nitrogen to and it shrinks quickly and then when you put the balloon back out in regular air it immediately expands. The other thing about gases is that it flows very freely. If you put gas in a pipe it can quickly reach far distances in much faster speed compared to either a liquid or a solid and this makes it really easy to transport through pipes. Gases also have very uh, low densities so if you compare the density of a gas versus a liquid or a solid you see that the units of the density of a gas is expressed as grams per liter whereas for solids and liquids it's expressed as grams per milliliter. Okay, so the volume that we use to measure the density of liquids and solids is a thousand times smaller compared to that of a gas. The other thing about gases is that it tends to mix very easily with other gases. I just gave an example earlier about air, which is composed of 18 different gases. Solids, of course, they don't mix at all. You're going to have to melt them, and so they're, they're really hard to mix. The most interesting feature of gases that solids and liquids don't really have is gas pressure. Gas is actually composed of a number of particles that are just moving randomly around and they hit one another and a lot of times they hit the container and that's what generates pressure that we can measure. So pressure is defined as the force that's exerted by the particle per unit of area, in this case the area of the container. You can write an equation like this where pressure which has a symbol P is equal to F over A, force over area. In the atmosphere the gases exert uniform force on all the surface area that surrounds it. So that resulting pressure that we can measure is what we call the atmospheric pressure. In order for you to be able to see how powerful uh, atmospheric pressure is, you really need to do an experiment like this. This can is filled with air and what we're doing here is we're connecting that can to a pump that will suck out all the air, right? Just like a vacuum. And so when we do that, when we remove all the air from inside the can, immediately the can is crushed. It's not the vacuum that's crushing the can, it's really the atmospheric pressure outside of the can that's consistently pressuring or pushing on the can. And when you have air inside the can, those two pressures balance each other out. However, when you remove the air inside the can, then only the outside air is exerting that pressure so the can is completely crushed. And that tells you how strong atmospheric pressure is. In the SI unit, the force quantity has a unit of Newton which is just mass times acceleration due to gravity because air put pressure on objects on the surface of the earth. The pressure is the amount of force in Newton that is being exerted over a particular square meter of area. So the unit of pressure in the SI system is Newton per square meter. This is not something we would use too much in chemistry, but it's useful to see it. Instead of calling it Newton per square meter, we just call it Pascal. And that's a really fairly tiny unit 
unit of pressure. So usually the way we measure pressure in any reasonable application is to use the unit kilopascal, which is a thousand times pascal. How do we measure atmospheric pressure? Originally, we actually develop it by comparing the pressure to height of a liquid. And the way we do it is the following. We're going to have a liquid like mercury, for example, is the one that's commonly used. And what we will do is we will fill up a cylinder with the same liquid, and then we would invert it. We would flip it over so the liquid is going to come out from the mouth of the cylinder. This side of the cylinder is closed, and the top of the liquid is a vacuum. Typically, of course, you expect that if you were to flip over a container of liquid, all the liquid will pour out, right? If you don't believe me, you know, try it with a cup of coffee and just flip that cup over and all the coffee will pour out. We don't see that happening when we do the experiment this way because the liquid will come down, but then it will stop coming down at a certain height. Well, that's actually how people originally discovered atmospheric pressure. They realized that the reason the liquid doesn't completely come down, even though gravity is pulling down on it, must be because there's something else that's pushing it up to stay up. And the thing that's pushing it up must be these gases that are exerting pressure down here. And as a result of that, pushing this liquid back up to stay at a given level. The height at which that liquid stays should correspond to the amount of atmospheric pressure that exists. Okay, so if the higher the pressure is, the higher that liquid will go. The lower the pressure is, the lower the height of this liquid. And in fact, we can derive an equation to show that there is a relationship between pressure and height of a liquid of a given density. Pressure is force per unit area. The force in this case is just the force due to gravity, which we call weight. And so it's just mass times gravity. Mass is M and gravity is G. Mass of a liquid is the same as its volume times its density. So we can replace that M here with V times D times G. Okay. And then the volume is really just its area times height. So if we bring all of these together into our pressure equation, the areas can cancel. In the end, we have this equation. So this tells us that the pressure that the gases exert can be measured by the height of a liquid that the gases are exerting pressure on. This is a proportionality, right? So the more pressure you have, the higher the height would be because gravity and density for a given liquid are constants. So those two numbers are not going to change. What's going to change is the height. The person who discovered that relationship of pressure to height of a liquid is Torricelli. And he is actually the person who also invented this device to help measure pressure. And that device is called a barometer. And this is the simplest possible barometer you can have. If you were to do this experiment at a sea level, which for example, Santa Monica would be considered at sea level, that would actually give you a height of mercury of 76 centimeter or 760 millimeter. We would say the pressure at sea level is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. We also use the unit Tor, which is equal to millimeters of mercury. If you were to go to a higher elevation, for example, like Mount Everest, further away from the surface of the earth, the amount of air particles that are pressuring down or they're exerting force on you is going to be a lot less. There's less and less air as you go further, further away from the surface of the earth. So in fact, if you were to measure that pressure at Mount Everest, you're going to get 270 millimeters of mercury, which is you know, about a third uh, of the pressure you experience at sea level. This is why when you're flying, where your height is uh, about 30,000 feet, the air in the airplane has to be pressurized in order to make sure that you're not having trouble breathing and, and all that type of stuff because you're used to operating at about 760 millimeters of mercury. This doesn't mean that we can't use other liquids to make our measurements of pressure. We could, but just imagine that if we were to use a liquid that is a lot less dense than mercury, what's going to happen is if you were to exert the same amount of pressure, a liquid that is less dense would be more easily pushed up, right? So then the height of that liquid is going to be a lot higher compared to mercury. And therefore, just from a practical standpoint of being able to see the measurement, it's easier to use a dense liquid like mercury. And that's the reason why mercury was chosen. Now you could actually derive this relationship 
which is that the height of a liquid relative to mercury, in this case we chose water, should be inversely proportional to its density relationships, right? So that makes sense. This is just mathematically saying what I just showed you, which is that if the liquid is a lot less dense, then it's a lot easier to push it uh, to a higher level. So that's why there's that inverse proportionality. Now the other instrument we use to measure pressure is something we call manometer. And this is used to measure the pressure of a gas that's inside a container. So it's not the atmospheric pressure. And there are two types of manometers that we can see. There's something we call a closed end manometer and there's another one called an open end manometer. The only difference is that with a closed end manometer, this tube is closed at the end. With an open end, they're open to the atmosphere. If the pressure of the gas in here is the same as the pressure of the gas on top of the mercury in here, then the levels are gonna be the same. That's true for whether it's the closed end or the open end. If they're the same level, that means that they're going to be the same pressure. The difference is just, of course, in the closed end, on top of this mercury here, there is no pressure. It's a vacuum, so it's zero millimeters or mercury. In here, if the level is the same, then that's also going to be zero. Now, if you put some gas in here, that gas is going to exert pressure on the mercury, so it's going to push the mercury up that way. So then you're going to see this relationship that looks like that. So this is still zero, but that one now is no longer zero. What is the actual pressure inside this container? Well, it's easy. You just need to measure the difference in height of the two levels of mercury, and that would be the pressure of the gas in here. With an open end, it's slightly different. You're comparing the pressure to the atmosphere. So not to zero, but to the atmosphere. So in this case, if the atmosphere has a higher pressure than your gas, then the relationship is gonna look like this, right? Where the atmospheric pressure is pushing the mercury down a lot more than your gas. So therefore the pressure of the gas is just going to be the pressure of the atmosphere minus the height difference that you see in the mercury. And that's written down here. If on the other hand, what you see is this type of behavior in the mercury levels, that means that the gas inside must be having a higher pressure compared to the atmospheric pressure. So then and the pressure of the gas inside must be the pressure of the atmosphere plus the difference in height. And again, that's written down here as well. Lastly, I just wanna point out a few units of pressure. We talked about Pascal, kilopascal, millimeters of mercury and tor. So at sea level, we define the pressure to be one atmosphere. Now one atmosphere is exactly equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. It's exactly equal to 101.325 kilopascal and so on. Another unit we see in everyday application is pounds per square inch or PSI. If you've ever pumped air into your tires, whether it's car tires or bicycle tires, you see that it says you have to have a specific PSI on the tire. And so one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSI. And then a bar is a unit very similar to atmosphere here. So one atmosphere is equal to a little bit higher than one bar, okay? And that's typically used in weather type applications.